Hi everyone, my name is Dan Gedim and I'm the Executive Director of Reckoning Inc. And today I'm going to present to you an overview of the work that we've been doing at Reckoning Inc. into how to find enslaved African American ancestors, especially if your ancestors are from border states such as Kentucky, Delaware, Maryland, Missouri, and to some extent also the District of Columbia West Virginia and Tennessee, all places where slavery was legal and um, that either remained in the Union during the Civil War or were occupied by the Union during the Civil War, such as Tennessee. This work grew out of a public radio series that I produced called The Reckoning. And in that series, I interviewed several descendants of a family that had been enslaved at a plantation near Louisville, Kentucky, where I live. And as they learned the names and details of their enslaved ancestors, they described this as really life-changing uh, for them. And that they thought that this was an important part of what reparations might look like for African Americans who descended from enslaved people. So the enslaved in this country were rarely named in official records. White people, generally speaking, did not keep track of who black people were by name unless they had a good reason to do so. Usually that had to do because of money. Either they were putting a will together and they wanted to make sure that their property, including their human property, was bequeathed to the proper family members. Uh, perhaps there was a lawsuit and the um, uh, there was a decision made that uh, one party had to pay another party a certain amount of money and there were perhaps enslaved people involved as property that were then auctioned off or actually given to the um, plaintiff in the suit. Um, and also there were bills of sale for various kinds of commodities but in particular for land. So it was very common uh, back in the 19th century rather than someone going to a bank to get a loan to buy a piece of property that you might go to the actual landowner and um, work out a, a payment deal with them, such as I'm going to put down a certain amount of money and then I will pay off the remainder of the loan over X period of time and as collateral I will put up these enslaved people and I will name them by name uh, with their age and um, their name and sometimes their relationship to one another, uh, Maria and her three children, as an example. The U.S. Census, starting in 1850 and continuing into 1860, um, separately kept track of enslaved people, but only by age, gender, and their color. And when I say color, uh, either black or mulatto, meaning mixed race, so here's an example of a, of a slave schedule showing a group of people who were enslaved by this particular enslaver, um, William um, uh, Bullitt. Now, military records were one place where enslaved people, or technically formerly enslaved peoples, uh, were named um, and had other information about them uh, listed. And this, so this is specifically for enslaved men who enlisted as soldiers. They were listed by their first and last name, their age, their birth location, and importantly, in border states like Kentucky, the Army also kept track of the names of their enslavers. Why did they do this? Because um, Abraham Lincoln, in a... Uh, in a plea, I guess, to keep as many of the states of the Union in the Union as possible that were slave states, um, announced a deal whereby if any of the men that they enslaved enlisted in the Army, they could be, the enslaver could be compensated for that loss, $300 per enslaved man who joined the Union Army. Now, the identity of the enslavers is noted in a couple of different places. So it's noted in the Combined Military Service Records, known as CMSRs, and it's also noted in a set of ledger books that were maintained by Army clerks. 
and, um, and we'll show you an example of that in a minute. And the uh, U.S. colored troops were often given the surname of their enslaver. So why is that important? Well, because as you start looking for your enslaved ancestor, you may, them, you may know them by one name, but the army knew them by a different name. So let's look at um, an example of uh, one of these ledgers in just a second, and, and you'll see why these are so powerful. The, these ledger books were kept... Uh, so far, I've been able to find them for uh, the states of Missouri and Kentucky online. There are apparently other ledgers that exist um, in, the, um, in the holdings of the National Archives for other border states, but they exist only in paper form. Uh, so we found three ledger books that list the names of roughly 9,000 uh, enslaved men, uh, or 9,000 black men from Kentucky who joined the um, U.S. Colored Troops. Um, and it has all the information that I've mentioned earlier, including the names of their enslaver. So here's an example of one of these. Um, the ledger books show the birthplace, show the age, um, show uh, other information when they, were, when they enlisted, where they enlisted, but it also shows the name of their enslaver. So in this case, for this group of men who you see on the far left, um, they're all carrying the last name of Dixon, which was the surname of their enslaver, Archibald Dixon. Now, it's important to note that in all probability, none of these men actually went by the name of Dixon in their normal life. Um, however, it was, um, there was a um, military order um, that was enacted by one of the generals who was in charge of the territory that included uh, Kentucky, who made a decision during the Civil War, prior to the period of time where black men were, were, were legally able to join the army, which was uh, mid-1864, that if a black man, an enslaved black man, were to join the army in Kentucky, that he should be given the name, um, the surname of his enslaver. Uh, partially as a way, I guess, this is my, uh, I'm surmising this, so that um, there would continue to be an association in the paper records in the military of the formerly enslaved man and his previous enslaver for the purposes of these um, compensation claims. So enslaver names also show up in these, in the military records, the combined military records for soldiers. So here's an example of one of the men that we saw in the ledger a second ago, his name is Jim Dixon, and it says, owner, Arch Dixon, Henderson, Kentucky. So um, if, there, so if, if a, a, a man might not show up in the ledger book, you might be able to find his name, the enslaver's name, in the CMSR and vice versa. There's a third place you can look for this information, and that's in enlistment papers. So you don't find this 100% of the time, but it's always worth looking for. In the lower left corner of enlistment papers, you will sometimes see the name and sometimes the actual signature of the enslaver. So it says, owner's address, Arch Dixon, Henderson, Kentucky. So in this case, I don't believe this is uh, Mr. Dixon's handwriting. This is the, the clerk's handwriting, but nonetheless, this is one way of noting that in all likelihood the enslaver gave his blessing or her blessing for this man to join the army. So it just so happens that we know historically that Archibald Dixon was a, uh, one of the most um, staunch supporters of Abraham Lincoln in Kentucky, um, supported him when he ran for president, supported him in the, all throughout the Civil War and was a very loyal Union man. Uh, also, though, he was one of the major enslavers in the state of Kentucky. Now, military files can sometimes contain um, compensation forms. So you'll get to see the actual paperwork of the enslaver as they were submitting application for one of these $300 compensation claims. So I recently queried the National Archives website looking for compensation forms for uh, U.S. colored troops. And I was able to find almost 19,000 records that had compensation files. 
Um, so these are readily available. There are, you know, uh, tens of thousands of them online. And they are a treasure trove of information that you can um, sometimes glean about not just the immediate enslaver who enslaved the soldier at the time they were enlisting in the army, but perhaps the previous enslaver as well. Because in many cases, during the lifetime of even a young man who was joining the army, the, his ownership may have passed from one to another, sometimes two or three different people in his lifetime. So in this case, this particular soldier, Emmanuel Taylor, at the time that he was um, enlisting in the army, his, his enslaver of record was a guy named H.B. Grant. However, he previously had been owned by a man named Sam Richardson, Samuel Richardson. And it shows that he had actually been purchased shortly before he joined the army uh, in May of 1864. Um, and um, I happen to have done a little research into this man, so I happen to know that H.B. Grant was the son-in-law of, of uh, Samuel Richardson. So basically he transferred ownership to, uh, of Man Emmanuel to his son-in-law. Now, compensation forms at um, the NARA website, National Archives website, archives.gov, exist for the states of Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, West Virginia, Tennessee, Delaware, and a handful in the District of Columbia. So this gives you a good idea of um, the breadth of where um, black soldiers were enlisting from in the border state region. And as I mentioned earlier, Tennessee is included here because Tennessee came under Union control fairly quickly uh, by U Ulysses Grant, who became, I guess, like the military governor of the region that um, Tennessee uh, was included in. Um, and there were quite a few Kentucky soldiers who crossed the border from southern uh, Kentucky into Tennessee to enlist. Um, they also entered into Tennessee from southeastern Kentucky as well. So these forms, as I mentioned, provide the names of previous enslavers. There will be affidavits sometimes or copies of um, receipts from a uh, transaction. So in this case, there was a sale from one person to another in the year 1819, $700 changed hands as um, one enslaver sold this man to another enslaver. Uh, George Foster is the name of the, uh, looks like. Um, the Negro man, Charles, was sold from George Foster uh, to, not quite clear, I can't read it, but it's, it's a, incredibly useful way to learn more about who enslaved your ancestors. And this is important because once you know the name of an enslaver, then you can start to look at probate records. Um, so you can find um, wills, estate inventories, um, uh, various kinds of legal documents pertaining to a, a person who, who was deceased in the family of the enslaver. So sometimes this might be the father or the mother of the enslaver, or you could go back a couple of generations, and it could be a grandparent um, who died and left the enslaved person to the enslaver of record at the time that they joined the army. So Family Search has just recently created uh, an incredibly useful uh, new tool, which you can find at this URL, um, that allows you to search through um, roughly a hundred million uh, documents that um, are in their archives of various kinds of uh, official records, especially probate records for North America. And so you can literally put in the name of the enslaver and um, use some combination of the words servant, Negro. Um, those are usually the two most likely words that would be used to describe an enslaved person who was being bequeathed, let's say, from person A to person B, or was included in the inventory of the belongings, if you will, of a deceased person. So very useful 
tool uh, that um, Henry Louis Gates has called a game changer for African American genealogy, well worth checking out at the URL that you see on your screen. Now, um, another incredibly important resource that exists for African Americans who have ancestors who were enslaved in one of these border states in particular are pension cards. Um, pension cards for, for um, Union soldiers who after the war or either they died and their widow or mother or dependent child applied for a pension on their behalf or um, they lived after the war and applied for a um, invalid pension um, basically you know in lieu of social security or a, or a employer pension that we would have today <clears throat> so here is a case where the man that we saw several slides ago who had joined the army and was called Jim Dixon uh, who was enslaved by this guy Archibald Dixon well in point of fact he was known to to everyone in his life as James Sanders and so this shows you these these pension cards both the name that they served in the army under which was Jim or James Dixon and the name they were actually known by in uh, peacetime after the war which is in this case James Sanders so um, there's so much information that can be found just on these pension cards um, you, you can see right underneath his name you'll see the name of his widow um, Elizabeth Dixon and it just so happens that as I was doing research into this particular soldier I only knew the name of his first wife and I didn't realize there was a second wife so the very fact that I found this other woman's name led me to believe that his first wife must have died it turns out she died in childbirth you can I also didn't know when when he died well if you look at the bottom of the screen you'll see that um, his widow applied for a pension in March of 1910 which gives me a clue that he must have died somewhere maybe earlier in the in the year 1910 and it tells me where he probably died because it's a state from which filed so they were living in Kentucky at the time where when he filed his invalid pension in 1890 uh, and then when his widow Elizabeth filed for a widow's pension they were living in Indiana so that's an enormous amount of information that can be find, found in these little cards and family search uh, about a decade ago digitized and indexed all of these pension cards so they're freely available at uh, familysearch.org and actually there is a search tool um, that can be found on family search just for the pension files the general index to pension files and so you could put in and, and and this particular search tool searches not just it searches both names so if if you only knew the name that uh, let's say you were a descendant of James Sanders and maybe you knew through oral history that you had an ancestor who served in the Union Army and his name was Sanders James Sanders or Jim Sanders well you could put in James Sanders here and um, there would be a positive hit in the search results regardless of the fact that he served in the army under uh, James Dixon so incredibly useful uh, tool a similar tool exists on uh, on ancestry but um, I, I'm, I'm particularly uh, showing you tools that are on family search uh, both because of uh, family search putting on roots tech but also because uh, it is 100% free to, to use the information on family search versus you know the, the paywall that exists at uh, Ancestry and Fold3 which also has copies of these pension cards so pension files are this incredible treasure trove of information that can give you additional information about your ancestor and your ancestors uh, extended family uh, you can oftentimes learn the names of the soldiers parents the soldiers siblings um, previous um, spouses um, you'll often see a list of the soldiers children especially if they were dependent children minors at the time that he um, 
died. Um, and there's also a lot of medical information. So in this particular case, there's information about a, 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 a disorder, a disease that this guy was suffering by, suffering with, um, which turned out to be a probably a congenital disease that ran, excuse me, that ran in the family of this man's family, um, and his descendants three three gener no five generations later, one of them ha was still suffering from this particular disease, which um, is now known as multiple myeloma, a form of cancer. So uh, incredibly useful information that can be found in the health records of these pension files. Also, you can find a bunch of things in these pension files that you may not be able to find anywhere else in, um, in terms of online records. So on the left, you see a marriage certificate that I could find no other marriage certificates for the second marriage of this man. And it shows the maiden name you know, of his second wife, Williams, Lizzie Williams. So that's very helpful information. And then on the right, you find his death certificate, um, which I otherwise couldn't find. So it, it can be a, a very useful place to find information that you might not otherwise be able to find, including burial information. So in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, these soldiers were buried um, in military cemeteries, the headstone was provided by the military, and there um, is paperwork available online that tells you exactly where the soldier is buried. So this was particularly poignant for this man, Russ Bolds, who was the second great-grandson of James Sanders slash Dixon, because he actually lived about a mile away from this military cemetery in Marion, Indiana. And he and his grandfather had gone to this cemetery many, many times when he was a child and, and a teenager looking for the gravestone of his grandfather's grandfather. Um, so he was the grandson of James Sanders. And he knew his grandfather was buried there. He just didn't know where because he was looking for James Sanders. And the name on the headstone is James Dixon. Now... As I mentioned earlier, other family members applied for pensions, including um, widows, but also minors. So in this particular case, this man, um, uh, Montgomery Greathouse, and by the way, in this case, it turns out he went by two different names, first names. He was known as James Greathouse. He was also known as Montgomery Greathouse, which was his middle name. And you see here his uh, widow, who turns out to be his second wife, and also that um, there was a minor child involved that was still a minor at the time of this man's death in 1914. So all sorts of useful information can be found on these cards. Um, many of the, the um, U.S. Colored Troop widows' pension files are online. They can be found, find, found in a couple of places. Fold3 is the institution that had been... Um, uh, tra um, making copies of them, digitizing them, and putting them online. But they had a deal with the National Archives because that's where the pension files actually exist, that uh, they would have exclusivity behind their paywall for a period of time. Um, and then thereafter, the rights to the images would go back to uh, the National Archives, or at least the National Archives would have the ability to... Um, to show them on their website, and in point of fact, there are um, uh, tens of thousands of pension files available on the National Archives website. It's, it's a bit tricky to find them. They're in five or six different locations on the National Archives website, um, but they are there, and if you have a Fold3 account, uh, you can definitely find them. Uh, fairly easily on the on the uh, uh, Fold3 website. Now, on our website, so our organization has a multifaceted website called ReckoningRadio.org, and there are many resources pertaining to U.S. Colored Troops in particular. So if you click on the Civil War Soldiers um, menu, or item on our menu,
So here's an example of um, one of the men who is in this um, database that we have put together of Civil War soldiers from Kentucky. And it just so happens that this particular man, George Brown, was also enslaved by that guy, Henry B. Grant. If you remember, I showed you a few slides ago uh, some information about an enslaved man named Emanuel Taylor, who had also been enslaved by Henry Grant, and his previous enslaver was Samuel Richardson. So here's another soldier for whom we have that information. Um, we also have data available um, in spreadsheet form, and if you go to the, the Civil War Soldiers link on our website, we give you the option of looking at all the soldiers that we have, and we have um, over 20,000 soldiers in our database, and it will let you um, rearrange the data in various ways. You can sort by the last name of the soldier, you can sort by uh, the enslaver's last names, and, and sometimes, in some cases we will know multiple enslavers for a particular person. So if you look at this particular group of soldiers, um, you know, in, in several cases we know the original name of the enslaver, the original enslaver, and then the second enslaver. So it can be as simple as, if you look on the very bottom of the screen, uh, this guy Samuel Grundy dies and he leaves a will, and he bequeaths this enslaved man, Robert Grundy, to, um, it's unclear whether it's his wife, uh, probably his wife, Nancy Hopkins um, uh, Lacey Grundy. I think there's a high probability that's his wife. Uh, and in some cases, it's obvious. If you look a little higher up, you see the uh, soldier Daniel Doom, and his uh, original enslaver was Benjamin Doom, Colonel Benjamin Doom. He dies, and his widow, uh, Cassandra Doom, um, is, receives uh, this enslaved man as uh, uh, property in the settlement of his estate. So we have um, well over 500 pension files from Kentucky uh, U.S. Colored Troops on our website. Um, if, you, if you look under the uh, Civil War Soldiers tab, there's a, a, a menu item specifically for, for pension files. And in a similar way, you can sort through these in a variety of ways, or you can simply search by name for a particular soldier for, for uh, whose pension file you're looking for. And we are acquiring more of these pension files all the time. They're being uh, given to us by various descendants of U.S. Colored Troops from Kentucky. Um, so uh, that number is going to grow, hopefully, um, uh, exponentially over time. So we also have something called the Kentucky Black Ancestor Database. So this is not just um, Civil War soldiers, but it's inclusive of Civil War soldiers. So this database was um, originally put together by a military historian from Nelson County, Kentucky, named Charles Lemons. And uh, we've been in a partnership with him now for, gosh, it's about a year and a half, maybe two years at this point. Um, when he started, uh, or when we first learned about him, he had 50,000 records of black people f who were living in Kentucky during the uh, antebellum early 19th century period. Uh, it's a combination of free, pe free people of color and enslaved people. It includes soldiers it all, and civilians. About half of the people in the database have at least one enslaver noted. About a third of them have at least one parent noted. Um, and of this group, we've got uh, roughly 20,000 soldiers. About 12,000 of them have an enslaver name. And it is also available um, to look at as a spreadsheet. And also, you can do uh, various kinds of searching by name uh, for a particular person or look by an enslaver or um, browse by county, or, and there's a variety of other ways to look at them. Now, if you look at it as a spreadsheet, what becomes apparent quickly is all of the family groups that are represented in this enormous um, database. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but if you look three columns over, column D, um, you'll see that uh, there's a, 
groupings of people and what they have in common is the first five numbers in their, it's called family code. And so uh, the way he organizes this database, he gives the eldest known female in a particular family's line a five digit, a unique five digit number. And then when she has children, um, he gives uh, a letter code after her name, uh, after her number rather. So her children would be, you know, 0002A, B, C, D. And, uh, and in, 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 so just by being able to sort by this number, you immediately start to find these family groups. And in many cases, we know at least the name of the mother, if not the, the mother and the father. So as, as I, I pointed out to you in the soldier database, oftentimes there are multiple enslavers that, are, uh, that we know about um, for individual enslaved people. So in this particular case, we know that these, this particular group of enslaved people who were the children of Caroline Atherton um, changed hands at least three times um, as after their original enslaver, uh, this guy John Atherton died. Um, so, and in some cases, it's six or seven different enslavers that we, that this Mr. Lemons was able to find reference to um, in various kinds of probate records and other kinds of legal records. In addition to the military records and the probate records, we have been looking very carefully at church records, um, starting with um, Catholic church records because they have the most detailed uh, amounts of information in them. And here's, you can see here all the different ways that you can interact with this particular database. So these are transcriptions of baptismal records that were originally written, most of them in Latin, and then translated to English and typed up. And then we in turn have been adding them to a database. So this is the, 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 the typewritten transcription that we find, found in a local archive uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, where we're located. Um, and then we took that information and we add it to uh, a database. And so these are examples of the database records. And so we will transcribe the actual uh, baptismal record and then we will pull out of that all the data that can be found in there. So the baptismal date, the name of the child, the name of the mother, you know, what church were, what were they baptized at, the name of the uh, mother's enslaver, the name of the father's enslaver, etc. Any information that we can find in that data, in the uh, baptismal record. We're also um, transcribing records of enslaved marriages and burials uh, in the church. Um, now, not only are we looking at Catholic records, we're also looking at records from other Protestant faiths, in particular. Uh, the Episcopals and the Presbyterians for sure did infant baptism and kept records that exist online on Family Search. Um, hundreds of churches from Kentucky uh, whose um, church registers have been digitized by uh, Family Search over the years and are available for free on the Family Search website. Um, there are also records for the Baptist and Methodist churches, which were uh, the two most popular um, denominations in Kentucky during the antebellum era. However, um, the Baptists, uh, by their nature, don't do infant baptism. They wait until people are older to do baptism. And so there, uh, there aren't as detailed records for enslaved people. Um, so it'll just mention that a particular enslaver had X number of enslaved people in their household who are going to church with them. And all we'll have are their names. Um, there'll be no ages. There'll be no, you know, there'll be no idea when they were born or where they were born or when they were baptized or any of that stuff. And for the Methodists, so far, we have not found any example 
of Methodist churches in Kentucky that baptized enslaved people and kept, and or at least kept records of them. But we haven't looked at every single church. It just sort of, we uh, looked at a handful of them throughout the state and couldn't found them, find them yet. So the project that we've been um, working on, in particular the U.S. Colored Troop Project, could be replicated in other states where there are, um, that were border states, specifically border states, because as I mentioned to you, in each of those states um, <clears throat> where compensation claims existed, there's a, a rich set of records that exist um, that, are, that can, are, are even available online. Um, and these pension cards that have the alternative names of uh, USCT soldiers, as I mentioned earlier, are, are going to be shared with us by FamilySearch in, as a database. Um, and we would be happy to share um, everything we've learned about this process with others. Um, and I'll have my contact information here momentarily. There it is. Um, so if anybody who... Um, sees this presentation, is interested in, in contacting me in particular, or going on our website, reckoningradio.org, uh, to look at some of the resources that I showcased earlier in the presentation. We also have a presence on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, although frankly, uh, we're not prolific posters on any of those platforms. So predominantly, uh, our website is where you'll find uh, the key information uh, all that we've all of the resources that are described in the presentation today. Um, that's it for now. Um, hope you've gotten something out of this presentation and that will in some way help you in your own search for your ancestors. Thank you.